All right, let's get this party started. Yeah. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Seattle City Club's District 3 debate. My name is Chris Daniels. I'm the chief reporter at King TV, joined alongside by David Hyde with KUOW and Joel Moreno of Como TV. Seattle City Club would like me to acknowledge their presenting sponsor, Amazon, their supporting sponsor, AARP, and the host sponsor, Town Hall Seattle, for making this debate possible. And now, please welcome our Seattle City Council District 3 candidates, Egan Orion and Shama Sawan. This will be an exchange of ideas, but others will call this a debate. We're also going to attempt to ask some fun questions tonight, as well as the questions that you have submitted from the audience. For the next hour, we'll be asking questions of the two people who would like to occupy the seat, which includes the neighborhoods of Capitol Hill, Montlake, Leshy, Madrona, and the Central District. We'll be limiting answers to 60 seconds with 30 second rebuttals. We will ask the audience to limit their applause as well, so we can hear more from the candidates because that is why you are here tonight. Those candidates include the incumbent, Shama Sawant, who is seeking her third term on the council. She rose to fame as the champion of $15 an hour minimum wage and is proud to say she leads a movement. I think we just heard some of that applause. She made history when first elected as the first self-described socialist on the council in more than 100 years in Seattle and that has gained her a lot of fans and she would even tell you some foes. Our other candidate tonight is Egan Orion, a first time candidate who has had success running the Capitol Hill Chamber of Commerce. Pride events and has been an event organizer and is not afraid to organize a flash mob. <laughs> he has also said Seattle needs, in his words, a queer voice on the council and someone who will show up in the community and listen to constituent needs. And so we will start there. Egan, you have never held public office before. What makes you feel better equipped to serve as a councilman? So I've spent the last 15 years or so serving my community through my work with Pride Fest. I've built that event for one for 10,000 people to one for over 200,000 people. And the way that I did that was by working with community partners, with businesses large and small, with nonprofits, with government. I bring to the table a collaborative style of leadership, and I think that that's what's so desperately needed right now. We have a lot of big challenges to face in, in our city right now, from homelessness to the affordability crisis, transportation, a lot of things to tackle. And uh, I think that by bringing all of us together, we can really move the city forward. Council Member Sawant, by rule, will give you 30 seconds to respond to what Egan just had to say. There's no question that we need unity and coalition building in order to take the city in the progressive direction. But the crucial question is unity and collaboration and coalitions with whom? My opponent is the poster child for big business. He has more corporate money than any candidate in Seattle City Council history. And we know what corporations like Amazon and Chamber of Commerce are trying to do. They are trying to flip City Hall to the right and reverse our progressive victories. If we want to go forward, we have to fight against corporate PACs. So this is the first time I give, get to give a warning about clapping. It will lengthen the evening and we won't get as much in. So 
Uh, a question for you, Councilmember Swan. Since attendance has been made an issue by Mr. Orion, I'd like to address your attendance in the council. Records show you canceled your Human Services Committee hearing, which helps to govern the homelessness response 10 out of 11 sessions in a row. Between July 24, 2018 and February 19th of this year, your committee only met three times and you canceled 13 meetings. Why are you canceling those meetings? First of all, when you look at the record of my council office for the last six years, we have shown what is possible with an elected voice for Seattle's working people and the marginalized, with an elected representative who is willing to use their office as an organ to build coalitions in the grassroots. We made Seattle the first major city to win the historic $15 minimum wage. After that, we ended Columbus Day and ushered in Indigenous Peoples Day. We have won landmark renters' rights laws despite the vicious opposition of corporate real estate lobby. And we have won victory after victory for ordinary people whose voices weren't heard until we were elected. And uh, the calculations that the corporate media has used for meetings is absolutely nonsensical. I don't have the time to explain it, but these numbers are completely wrong and inaccurate. And in reality, my office has a historic record of bringing committee meetings to the district and making them accessible to ordinary people like never before. For, for the record, that is part of the public record, but Egan will let you have 30 seconds to respond. Sure. You don't have to ask the quote-unquote corporate media. You can just ask her colleagues at city council. She has the worst record of holding meetings for any committee chair. So either Councilmember Sawant doesn't believe that we're in a homelessness crisis or she's not telling the truth. Uh, I think we are in the middle of a, of a crisis and we need a leader who's going to make a commitment, who's going to show up and do the work for the people of Seattle, including our homeless. Let's keep talking more about homelessness and affordability with my colleague David Hyde from KUOW. Shama, this one is for you. Um, in, as you know, rents in Seattle have jumped 70% since 2010. That's forced some people to become homeless, others to leave Seattle. But at the same time, small landlords are saying, look, their property taxes are going through the roof. So why do you think rent control is the answer? First of all, absolutely, on the question of property taxes, that is a consequence of the fact that Seattle and Washington State have the most regressive tax system in the entire nation, and it's actually the corporate PACs and the corporations that are donating to my opponent and a candidate in every district this year they have been the obstacle to bringing about progressive taxation. You saw the corporate bullying and extortion that Amazon, the role played by Amazon last year in repealing the Amazon tax that we had fought hard for. And in fact, we need to unite small landlords, homeowners, renters, small businesses, everybody who has a progressive vision for our city. We need to get united not only to win universal rent control free of corporate loopholes. We also need to win a massive expansion of social housing that is publicly owned, high quality affordable housing by taxing big businesses, not small business, not middle class homeowners, and not working people who are already disproportionately bearing the burden of the tax. Egan, <laughs> Egan same question for you. Uh, what's your position on rent control? So if you ask any economist out there, save for perhaps my opponent, they'll all tell you that rent control is not workable and it will actually destroy the thing that you actually want to do, which is create more housing. Councilmember Swant's proposed rent control plan released just six weeks before the election, after six years of talking about it, will not work. Not only is it illegal under state law, but it's, it's, it's not a solution to the issues we have at hand. And to the small landlords that she's talking about, this would totally destroy their livelihood. They would sell those apart apartment buildings, get out of the rental industry altogether, and they're some of our best actors who actually keep rents at below market rate. I've proposed immediate and long-term solutions to address uh, our housing crisis, including bold and evidence-based anti-rent gouging measures and an emergency fund to help uh, renters bridge uh, a job loss or a family crisis, as well as robust legal support to uh, help them fight powerful property management companies. Mr. Orion, by, uh, we're gonna deviate just a little bit here because you did take a, uh, it raised a question about uh, Councilmember Sawant's policy. So Councilmember Sawant, you can respond 30 seconds. Thank you. Uh, 
my opponent will never tell you how he is going to fund these emergency funds or any other proposal because the, uh, his corporate benefactors are going to be absolutely opposed to any progressive measures to uh, raise the revenues. And in fact, we need to do big outreach with small landlords, many of whom who agree with our rent control proposal. One of them is sitting right here, Kathy Yassi, who's a central district resident. And uh, the reason we are pushing for rent control this year is after having won many victory after victory, we now have momentum. Bernie Sanders has supported rent control. This is the bill that Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez just released today or yesterday on rent control, and it is the exact same policy that we have. Oregon has won it, California has won it, New York has won it, we can do it too. All right, that's my second warning on applause. Second warning, all right. Uh, we're going to keep though, talking about housing and homelessness. Joel Moreno from Como TV has more questions. Thank you. Regarding the proposed regional homeless authority, there's already been some doubts expressed by city leaders in Auburn, Federal Way, other jurisdictions about their uh, concerns with the governance structure of this proposal, mm -hmm. uh, even comparing it to the safe injection sites where no one wanted it cited, uh, you know, outside of Seattle. Uh, explain your support or opposition to the Regional Homeless Authority. Let's start with you, uh, Egan. Yeah, sure. So what we've clearly seen over the past several years is that Seattle has been the only actor in the region that's been responding to the homelessness crisis. We've built up permanent supportive housing around it. We've built up services around it. And as a result of that, none of these other municipalities have actually invested in housing and in homeless, homelessness services. So what this regional authority would do is actually put more pressure on other municipalities and the county to have skin in the game. Obviously, uh, we in Seattle are still gonna be carrying the, the brunt of, of this particular crisis. And uh, you know we're happy to lead. We're, we're, we are compassionate and we have the services and the people that, to serve those that are experiencing homelessness. But I, I think we really wanna look at uh, under the hood and, and see how this is gonna work. But obviously we need to have other municipalities to have skin in the game. This is a regional issue and we should have a regional solution for it. And Shama, your support or opposition? Absolutely, we need a, a regional response because this is a regional issue. But here's the problem. When you have an intergovernmental body that is generally full of politicians that support corporate uh, agenda and big business and have consistently opposed the progressive measures that progressive elected officials like myself have brought forward, whether it's a city structure or a regional structure, it is not going to work for ordinary people. That is why the key thing that needs to happen this year is that voters in every district need to elect progressive and socialist candidates like myself, Tammy Morales, Sean Scott, who have all shown a track record of fighting for progressive policies, like expanding social housing funded by taxing big business, like rent control free of corporate loopholes, and let's also end the policies that don't work. This is, let's end the sweeps of homeless people because they don't work, they're inhumane, they're ineffective. The city spends $10 million every year on this. Let's end this, but the obstacle to this is corporations and their own candidates. My opponent actually has stunningly denied that there is even an affordability crisis. <laughs> um, no. <laughs> I'll give you 30 seconds to respond. Of course we're having an affordability crisis. When, when workers can't uh, can't rent uh, a unit when they're not making enough money, when they are pushed outside of the city and have to commute two hours each way just to get to work. We want the, the economy to be balanced for everyone at all levels in this, in, in this economy. So, and that includes workers uh, too, yeah, of course. Um, there's some people that can afford Seattle. The, the, uh, the rich and the big corporations are doing just fine. We need to balance the playing field so that workers have more opportunity in Seattle. And council member, 30 seconds, hard 30 seconds. Absolutely. I'm actually <laughs> quoting my opponent uh, in, in response, in his response to my uh, opinion editorial about the deep crisis of affordability and gentrification and economic eviction in the Chinatown International District. And he said that people in the International di District want more market rate housing. And he said rent control is a horrible idea. This is absolutely out of touch with the crisis that we are in. Trickle-down economics has failed us. 
What we need is elected officials who will not play games telling what, what one audience what they want and another audience the exact opposite answer during the election year. We, as you know, as you know, I do not play games. Whether you like what I'm saying or not, you will always got, get 100% truth. Time. So I have to respond. Yeah. If, if Council Member Sawan had been on the ground in, the, in, in Chinatown International District actually talking to community leaders, she would have heard this perspective as well. I'm not saying it's something that they are all saying, but this was actually something that one of the community leaders saw. There's, there's more affordable uh, housing in Chinatown ID than in any other part of the city. And what some of those, the small businesses are asking is that they also be a balance of housing. So there's market rate and affordable housing in that. So they have more customers so that they can flourish as well. All right, I'm receiving word from off stage here that as the applause continues, we're gonna factor that in into the timing on how long you both have to respond. So just a warning to the crowd as well. We're gonna move on to a topic about the central district, an issue that often gets conflated with homelessness from time to time, uh, and that is crime. After a pair of fatal shootings in the Central District last May, many people were concerned there about a rise in gun violence. Councilmember Sawant, you pitched at the time using raised flower beds and speed bumps to slow traffic to reduce drive-by shootings. Do you know where that stands right now with the Seattle Department of Transportation, and do you believe that it still is a good method to reduce violence in that neighborhood? Just to clarify the record, which the corporate media has really muddied, these were proposals that came from community members in a specific block range in the central district where they felt that uh, drive-by shootings would be limited and, uh, and they, because they were afraid for their children. And so as a representative of the central district constituents, I faithfully brought them into city hall so that they could have their voices heard. And after years of begging the mayor and the Department of Transportation to come and do a visit of their neighborhood, Finally, because they got a voice in my committee, they were, able to they were able to compel the mayor out of pressure of the coalition building to come and take a look. But ultimately, look, the uh, statistics, citywide, regionwide, nationwide, show, statistically speaking, the rise in crime has everything to do with the rise in inequality, the housing crisis, the fact that after school programs and counselors have been chronically underfunded in our shamefully underfunded schools. And that is why if we actually want to address public safety, then we have to have a commitment to end racial inequality, to have fully funded schools and services and housing by taxing big business. So again, it is part of the public record and on the Seattle channel as well, uh, what we just talked about. Egan, you have 30 seconds to respond. Well, first of all, I have to say that that, that, that complaint against Council Member Sawant is a little unfair. Whenever we're talking about Im improving safety in neighborhoods, environmental improvements are actually part of the solution. Now, I was actually, that's actually my neighborhood. Uh, I met with the mayor's office and SDOT and from, from someone from the SPD with our neighbors in order to do that walk around. And there are improvements that, that can be made as far as traffic slowing. Uh, also, we need to activate places like empty lots. And that was one recommendation that I brought up at 21st in Union to the, uh, the owner of that lot there. And we activated that with a food truck, with a community gathering space. And ultimately, that's where we found our campaign headquarters. And since that shooting back in May, there has not been uh, any violent crime on that block and since. And we'll, we'll have to end it there and turn it over to David Hyde here from KUOW. Egan, uh, staying with you, whose fault is it that Seattle is now out of compliance with the federal consent decree for constitutional policing? Well, frankly, when, when they, uh, the, city, the city council representation along with other folks that make up the committee that was uh, negotiating that contract, when they were doing that contract, they must have been a, a asleep at the wheel because that took three years to negotiate that contract. Every city council member, even though there was only two on the committee, had a chance to find out what was going every step of the way. The union, SPOG, was, uh, was negotiating in good faith. And yet it got to the end of that negotiation process and uh, council member Swamp voted against it, but the, the uh, contract was signed and was it was in force and you know later the council wanted to take it back because they were asleep at their job they had three years to negotiate that contract 
there are strong protections in there for accountable uh, constitutional policing. There needs to be more, but we need to wait until that contract is back up for negotiation in order to reopen that contract. Sham, same question. Whose fault is it? First of all, let's give credit uh, where the, uh, for the actual progress that has been made, if any. It is because of ordinary people, community members, especially members from the indigenous and black and brown communities who have for over a decade demanded justice in the case of Seattle Police Department, which has had a long track record of excessive use of uh, force and racially biased policing, this, which was confirmed with the Department of Justice consent decree. Unfortunately, I am not in the committee that uh, carries out negotiations with the police department. These are closed uh, shop negotiations. As a union member, I strongly support every public sector union to be able to negotiate its contract in full faith without uh, the public interference. However, the fact is that there was a rollback of accountability in this contract, and when it came to a yes-no vote on the council, as an elected representative, you have to take a stance. And unfortunately, on a majority people of color council and a super majority of women council, I was the only one, this is unfortunate, that stood with uh, communities of color and voted no on it. And as you know, Judge Robart has confirmed my decision. All right, let's move on to Joel Moreno from Como TV. Egan, I'll start with you. This is about repeat offenders. There's some new proposals out there from the mayor, county prosecutor, city attorney. Uh, to help Seattle deal with the people who cycle in and out of jail for these low-level crimes. Uh, do you think that these are good proposals, or what do you think would be the key steps to take to deal with prolific offenders? Yeah, I think if you ask people in communities across Seattle, they, they'll say that the current system is not working. I think we need to get a better handle on that. One of the ways that we can, we can do that is by investing in diversion programs like LEAD, Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion. What these folks who have these, uh, these high touches with the criminal justice system, what they don't need is necessarily more contact with the cr cr criminal justice system. They actually need social workers. They need pressure from prosecutors and they need to be accountable, held accountable by the police in order to get their life back on the, on the straight and narrow. LEAD has been shown to be extremely effective uh, in, in just 18 months in the program, folks are six, they, they get through that program, 60% are less likely to get back in touch with the criminal justice system. So we need to invest in solutions like LEAD that work, and we need to analyze all that's being, do being done by the county, the county prosecutor to see if these programs are really working. If you look out in the, on the city streets, it, it's, a, it's apparent that they're not. And Shama, are you on board with these proposals or do you have other ideas to deal with repeat offenders? The proposals are fine and in fact, uh, it was through our People's Budget Movement that we were able to win a million dollar expansion of lead, the LEAD program, the Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Program from Belltown into the uh, Capitol Hill and the Central District area. It was through a coalition building in the grassroots that we were able to win that and in fact, all of that is based on the idea of ceasefire policing, meaning if you actually give uh, people what they need in terms of a full, decent standard of living, dignity and humanity. Recidivism greatly reduces. Study after study shows that. But a key component of that also is housing. And it's interesting to see that the corporate-backed candidates in every race this year are promoting lead. I'm happy to see this because this was promoted actually won through the People's Budget Coalition. But in fact, we are not going to have win this end to recidivism and really give humanity to the people who are caught in this cycle if we don't fight to tax big business and the wealthy to fund housing, services, jobs, and many other issues. All right, let's leave it there and turn back to an issue which people are still talking about in this city, and that is the failed head tax, otherwise known as the employee hours tax. Amazon employs many people who live in this district and would have been impacted the most by this short-lived piece of legislation. We'll start with you, Councilmember Sawant. Would you revisit this issue if re-elected, and is there anything that you would do differently? See, Seattle has the most regressive tax system in the entire nation. It's an extremely wealthy city and a deeply unequal city in deep crisis. Homelessness, underfunding of schools, services, 
the lack of affordable housing. So of course it's a no-brainer, we need progressive taxes. But we cannot hold our breath and expect that the corporate-dominated state legislature is somehow going to get its act together after 40 years and do something about the regressive taxation. The fight, the struggle, the coalition building has to start here and now in Seattle, which is what we are doing. And in fact, the, the Amazon tax or the head tax is one of the very, very few mechanisms that is at the disposal of the city of Seattle to do. And I will proudly push for it. Again, I know there is huge support among ordinary people in the district and in the city. And let's just put this in perspective. Amazon did not uh, bully the city to repeal the tax because they were somehow going to go out of business. The tax they would have been liable for was less than 0.4% of their $3.3 billion profit in 2017. So let's just keep in perspective, these are the most profitable, I believe you have the wealthiest businesses. have reached the time sign there that's being waved at me. Egan, you have 30 seconds to respond. Okay, well, I don't know if we wanna go back and keep on fighting those old fights. I think one thing that we learned from the head tax debate is that residents didn't trust city council. One poll showed that 8% of voters trusted that council would use the head tax funds wisely. I'll work to regain trust with Seattle voters and, uh, and we will have a more accountable and transparent governance in the city as a result. So we're gonna to continue to speak along these lines and, and this is all about civil discourse here. Uh, we have quite a few questions from the audience uh, along these lines as it relates to the head tax and the meetings that occurred around the head tax and how some of those meetings turned uncivil in nature and led to polarization on the topic. You hear it in this room and you hear it with the candidates tonight. So Egan, we start with you. Can debate in the city of Seattle be civil again? Yeah, I always believe that debate can be civil. Um, throughout this whole campaign, we've, we've had civil arguments. I know that uh, in the Twitter sphere, which is what some people call real life, that it gets nasty, but I think that that's really the way that we have to move forward. As I've shown throughout my career, I work collaboratively, civilly, and you can do big things with that leadership style. I think that at times, City Hall has become a bit of a circus, and I realize that passions are running high. There are some big, important issues that we have to tackle, but while we're doing it, we can be civil. We can be uh, we can be respectful as we have these critical conversations. Councilmember Swant, what's your take on the disruptions at council I'm meetings? I'm really pained, but uh, unfortunately not surprised to hear my opponent refer to ordinary people, genuine people who are struggling to meet their basic needs, who come to City Hall to raise a voice. He's referring to that as a circus that is deeply disappointing, and that's Mayor Durkin's talking point. Look, the problem is that in the, in the most, uh, one of the most, one of the wealthiest cities in the history of humanity, with this unprecedented inequality, what we're seeing is the most uncivil and the most divisive thing is the system itself that makes untold profits for a few at the top and relegates the rest of us, the majority, to uh, you know, uh, just making ends meet somehow. And that is why we have to unapologetically fight for our rights. And the reason there is a debate, the reason there is a struggle, is because as Frederick Douglass said, power concedes nothing without a struggle. It never has and it never will. And the most uncivil thing that happened during the Amazon tax struggle was the way Amazon and Jeff Bezos engaged in extortion and bullying. That means less time at the end, right? That's what I heard, okay. She, she didn't fill the time, and we're gonna to continue to talk about other topics, including David Hyde from KUOW, you have a question. Shana, uh, following up on that, you've said Jeff Bezos is our enemy. Would it be better for Seattle if Amazon just moved elsewhere? The, the fact is that in, in a deeply divided society as we live under capitalism today, Businesses of the scale of Amazon and Boeing already move jobs when they can, when they want to, because there is always another state, another country, another continent where people are poorer and more desperate to accept jobs at lower conditions. And that is why the only way we can reverse this race to the bottom is to do what we did with the $15 an hour struggle. Actually begin the fight somewhere 
not believe the fake, uh, you know, it, mythical talking points by fake economists that somehow it was going to bring an apocalypse to Seattle. What instead happened is that Seattle's economy is booming, businesses are booming, workers are making higher wages, and the struggle for $15 an hour itself, the 15 Now campaign that I helped launch here with the labor movement went nationwide, and now it has become a topic of congressional discussion. That's the reversal of race to the bottom that we need. As long as we accept Boeing and Amazon and Microsoft calling the shots, we will always be going down. Egan, uh, your opponent says Amazon's trying to buy this election uh, by supporting your campaign. What's your response? Well, um, yeah, I think that if you just look at the history of how I've been a, a community organizer, the work that I've done in the LGBTQ community, the way that I've advocated for small business on Capitol Hill through the Broadway Business Improvement Area and the Capitol Hill Chamber of Commerce, true small businesses, you'll see that that narrative does not match the person that I am or the way that I'm running this campaign. If you want to know about a person's priorities, you should take a look about the, where the money that's going directly into their campaign is coming from. And from the start, we have kept this campaign hyper-local. Over 60% of the, the funds that, that have been contributed to our campaign come from within District 3. With Shama's campaign, that's 25%. And over 90% of our contributions come from the city of Seattle. These are the people that we have to lead, and those are the people that we want to contribute to our campaign. Can I? Can, can I? Uh, up zoning? Do you believe uh, up zoning can? Can, can I respond? Oh, did I jump? Uh, no, you're yeah, good. Joel, no, Joel from Como, we're going to keep moving. The question at we're we're, we're going to keep moving. Joel from Como. Sorry, we had one for each on that exchange, and now we're moving on. Can I in, in terms of housing affordability, uh, is, is upzoning the answer, and do you think more needs to be done to preserve existing low-cost units from being torn down uh, as things get developed? We we'll start with you, Egan. Oh, okay. Um, so is there enough being done? Is that what the question was? Sorry, I thought it was directed. Do you support upzoning, and do you think more needs to be done to preserve sure, sure, existing sure. low cost? Yes, yes, yes. I was in support of the MHA upzone. I believe that we should be creating denser uh, neighborhoods, uh, especially when they, uh, when they have access to services and to transportation. I think that we're going to see, with as SD3 is built out, that we're going to see more of those uh, upzone communities pop up to, so we can serve uh, more people, uh, so we have more housing for more people in the city. But I also think the neighborhoods across the city should be sharing in this density. You've actually seen our si single family neighborhoods get less dense over time rather than more dense. And so I'm proposing that we shift housing policy to allow for duplexes and triplexes and fourplexes ones that actually look like houses so they fit in with those neighborhoods so that all of Seattle can participate in this, uh, in this need for density. Shama? Absolutely, we need a serious uh, uh, approach towards density because if we are to bring sustainability, if we are to win the Green New Deal, then we need a denser city. But the question is affordability. Just building trickle-down economics-based and for-profit-based housing hasn't helped us. There's a 10% vacancy rate in this city. People are being pushed out at the same time that there's been a construction boom. So we need an ex expansion of social housing uh, by taxing big business that will also create construction and maintenance jobs. And in my remaining time, I do want to respond to this point about campaign donations. My campaign has hundreds more donations from District 3 in Seattle than any other candidate in this race, including my opponent. And the local uh, donors that my, my opponent is talking about, let's look at some examples. Jo billionaire John Stanton, who has donated hundreds of thousands of dollars to Republicans. Richard Hedreen, owner of multiple hotels, a known union buster. Again, uh, a known Republican supporter. And the list goes on and on. I don't have the time to list all the names because there's too many. Uh, I, I want to open that up for Egan, if you have a response to that. <laughs> yes, I do. So you give him a response, but you don't give me a response. It was the way that it was structured. So we are very proud to get most of our donations from within District 3. The fact that some of them are executives at 
Amazon, and some of them are workers just down the street. We are, we are proud that District 3 folks are chiming in with their money in order to uh, contribute to our campaign. Like I said, we've been keeping this hyper local. If she wants to talk about supporting Republicans, she brings up Republicans and it sort of just makes me think of what happened in the last election cycle with her going to swing states to campaign for Jill Stein. Let's talk about the, supporting the time Republicans sign is and up. Trump. Okay. The time can I, sign can I is respond? up. Uh, continuing with housing, uh, do any measures need to be taken to... Can, can I respond? Oh, we're going to go on. Do any measures need to be taken to balance the housing affordability needs of tenants with the rights of property owners? And I'm asking that in the context that uh, property owners have expressed concern about rent control policies and uh, uh, the uh, requirements to uh, accept qualified tenants on a first-come, first-served basis. Does a balance need to be uh, struck there? And we'll start with you, Shama. Absolutely, a balance needs to be struck urgently. But the problem is not renters having too much clout and too much political influence and corporate landlords getting squeezed out. It's exactly the opposite as you are asking. Corporate landlords have tremendous power and clout and the quality of rental housing, the rights of rent renters and what, they, what say they have in the rental market is entirely dependent on how much renters, ordinary people get organized and fight for their rights. And that's what rent control is going to need. And that fight is bringing, that coalition building includes small landlords. In my committee meeting on Monday where I unveiled our rent control proposal, which is exactly the same as Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez's proposal, we have welcomed small landlords to come and weigh in on the draft legislation and tell us their thoughts. But at the end of the day, I think landlords who do not exploit their renters, tenants, will agree with me and all the renters that nobody has the right to exploit or gouge any human being. Egan, balancing? Right. I think in government, we have to look at what the problem is and how we go about solving that problem. This rent control proposal from council member Sawant actually does the opposite of what it purports to do. It locks in a few lucky people into this rent control regime, but anyone else that wants to come to town is either gonna have to buy or live over in Kirkland or down in Burien because there will be no rental units available to us here. And I don't know what, what small landlords that you're talking to because every single one of that I've spoken to said the second that this ever has a risk of becoming law, they're selling their, their business and getting the heck out of Dodge. We'll give you 30 seconds, Councilmember Sawant. We have to have a sober assessment. Those of us who want to win housing justice and rent control and social housing, we have to have a sober assessment of the forces that are arrayed against us. The, the corporate real estate lobby will always hold small landlords as the, the you know, sanitized face of their opposition to rent control. And the reason they so viciously oppose rent control is not because it doesn't work, but because it works means it gives affordable housing and stable housing to so many of our families and children who face bouts of homelessness. And we learned in the $15 struggle, we will have lies of this kind in the, the first days of up. the movement. We will need to fight. So let's take a hard pivot and talk about transportation because a lot of people in this district also care about transportation. As you know, on the north side of the district, there's going to be some major retooling and potential traffic around the Highway 520 Montlake Interchange. What will you as a council member do to try and help mitigate the issues on that side of the district so that part of the city is not in gridlock? We'll start with you, Egan. Yeah, I've been, I've been having long conversation with folks uh, down in, in Portage Bay who have been communicating with WashDOT and SDOT and other officials about the major impacts of that. And for those of you who don't live in that area, you may not be dialed in on it, but essentially there's gonna be three different phases of construction, three years apiece that will last nine years. So rightfully, the folks in Portage Bay are concerned about the overnight construction that's going on. Uh, they're concerned about all the construction trucks moving through their area and all the fumes that they'll, they'll, they'll contribute to the area. They're con concerned about their roads being clogged. And I know that when I met with, with them, that they had had some contact with Councilmember uh, Sawant, but that 
uh, a, a suggestion about a noise variance had, or no, about an oversight committee had died in committee. Uh, as a council member, I would push to have that uh, taken out of committee and voted on so we have the oversight that we need to protect our communities. Council Member Sawant. Uh, my office and um, especially my policy analyst, Ted Verdon, who's here in his personal capacity, the two of us have engaged in extensive discussions with the community members in the whole area which is affected by the 520 construction, and we have an ordinance ready for an oversight committee. The obstacle to getting this passed is the fact that there is a labyrinthine and bureaucratic government, both at the city and the state level, that does not want to give community members their voices heard in that oversight committee. So the only way to overcome that obstacle is to continue doing what we are doing, which is bringing their voices into City Hall, which uh, were completely unheard and absent until my office got involved, because this is an important District 3 issue. But I'll tell you, the other thing is, there are other construction projects even on the, in the Capitol Hill area where people haven't spoken up. So what we need to do is bring everybody in the district and indeed the city who are impacted at this moment by these big projects so that we can bring a larger collective voice. All right, so we fit a lot in already. We're in the home stretch now. <laughs> uh, we're gonna try and do a flash round now. And what I mean by that is if you can limit your answers to one sentence, one sentence only. I know that's gonna be tough, but we're gonna try. One <laughs> sentence only. You'll be judged by the voters in the room, if you will. <laughs> so the first one, should Seattle toll downtown streets? Are you asking me? Egan? Uh, not unless there is an equity uh, option to address workers traveling downtown. Speaking as an economist, there is no such equitable option for congestion pricing or the tolling in downtown, so I'm opposed to that, and instead we should expand public transit greatly. Okay, these, these, next, few, these next few questions will be easier for one, one sentence. Favorite District 3 restaurant, Councilmember Sawant. <laughs> My favorite District 3 restaurant is Sabah Ethiopian Cuisine, which is right now struggling for relocation assistance against a corporate developer who has donated the maximum to my <laughs> Egan. Uh, for special occasions like the night after the November 5th election, uh, Spinasse, and for everyday comfort, uh, Bamboo Pho up on 15th. We're really trying for that one sentence here. <laughs> I was. It was all one Favorite sentence. place to go in District 3 on a sunny day, Egan? Volunteer Park. Councilmember Swan. I love Volunteer Park and the Arboretum. We did it. One sentence. Favorite place to go in District 3 on a cloudy day, Councilmember Swan. Squirrel Chops, Coffee Shop, and something like that. Egan? Vivace and Broadway. Best walk in District 3, Egan? Best walk? Walk. Oh, I, I walk six or eight miles a day with my dog. I think just walking the, the neighborhoods between the Central District and the backside of Capitol Hill, my favorite. Councilmember Swan? One of my favorite walks is the whole walk from my house in uh, CD Leshai all the way across Madrona and back to the CD. Here's a big one. What's the name of the District 3 resident that best typifies who you're working for and why? The name of the District 3 resident, Councilmember Swan. I've actually already named her, actually, Kathy Yassi, because she's a small landlord. She is, uh, uh, is also a union member, and she's a child care provider, all of which encapsulates the needs of our society. Egan. Yeah, yeah. Kiana and Devon, who run the post Postman and MLK in Union, they are an example of what uh, black business owners can do if they put their mind to it and have support from the community. What's, what's the biggest mistake the council made in this last election term and what was its best contribution? If you can do that in one sentence, Egan. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just gonna say because I'm, I'm, I'm nitpicking a little bit are these, are, are these short answers or these regular answers? <laughs> We're trying for one sentence here. Oh, okay. Um, backyard cottage legislation is a little iffy because of long-term rentals and MHA upzone because it's really going to make a dent in our affordable housing crisis. Councilmember Swan. Best thing the council has done in this last term is the move-in fee cap and payment plan, which, according to the urbanist, was the single best renter-related policy. And the worst thing, of course, was the repeal of the Amazon tax. 
All right, one more quick hitter. What committee would you want to serve on in this next term and why, Councilmember Sawant? I would serve on the committee that deals very directly with the housing crisis, and we want to pass rent control. Egan? The Human Services Committee that my opponent has been chairing because Seattle deserves someone who's going to show up and do the hard work. All right, now you're going to see some cards in front of you to help answer the next set of questions. Each candidate should respond by holding up one of two cards, underrated and overrated. I'll start with that. Can you, sorry, can you explain? It's not very clear. I'm going to say a phrase, and you're going to tell me if you feel that it's underrated or overrated. And okay. I'm going to start, uh, uh, well, I'm actually going to start with you, Egan, to keep it back and forth. Uh, but uh, single family housing, underrated or overrated? Please hold up the sign. <laughs> I think we should both hold them up at the same time. <laughs> let's, let's do it together. Okay. Yeah, we'll do it together. Speed this up. Natural gas. King County Metro Service. Electric scooters. <laughs> Navigation teams. Seattle streetcars. Flash mobs. <laughs> CBD oil. Sorry? CBD oil. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't I don't use it, so it's yeah. <laughs> Amazon Go. The Mariners. Sorry? Mariners. <laughs> All right, so you have solicited questions as you walked in tonight, and we have them up here at the table in advance of tonight's debate slash conversation. We've selected now a handful of them. Please limit your responses to 30 seconds, 30 seconds. I'll start. <clears throat> uh, this one is for you, Shama. Um, the person writes, as a local government employee, I have frequently heard concerns from my colleagues that you are disinterested in the independent analysis they provide unless it aligns with your ideology, what would you say to a public servant who is concerned that you ignore their hard work for ideological reasons? As a matter of fact, my office has a strong track record of welcoming different kinds of input. I think people feel unhappy when we don't agree with them. So listening is one thing. Whether you agree with a point of view or not is quite another. And I think our office is very thorough in considering various points of view. But we also make up our minds. We don't waffle. And we state the truth. I'll ask you, Ian, as well. Uh, do I need to? Re yeah, repeat the question. Well, actually, this was directed at Sean. So we'll. I guess move on to the next yeah, question. Yeah. I'm sorry, it was, it was specifically directed to Shama. This one too uh, is directed to Shama, uh, Shama, but I think you could probably both answer it. So let's start with Egan for this one. Okay. Um, what are you going to do to preserve green space in Seattle for parks, pea patches, and natural areas? Oh, I think this is critical for livability in, this, in the city. Uh, over the last year, there was uh, some talk of putting affordable housing on, in some of our parklands. We don't have enough green space as it is right now, so we need to preserve the green space that we have to make sure and make sure that it has equitable access uh, for all. I am also a proponent of the LID I-5 effort so that we can expand our park spaces. In addition to that, past the tree or ordinance, we need more trees in Seattle, not fewer. Shama? Uh, I first wanted to uh, congratulate all the ordinary people in our district without any desire for fame have been developing pea patches and vegetable areas and uh, many other green spaces. And I think the most important thing we need to do is to not allow the need for green spaces to be pit against all the other needs of our society, like 
uh, affordable housing and instead to bring everybody who's advocating for one or the other need of our society to bring everyone together because surely in a wealthy city like Seattle, we can have enough green space and affordable housing. Uh, this one's directed at Egan, but I think you both could answer. Uh, we'll start with Egan. Seattle's tree canopy is rapidly decreasing due to lot line to lot line development, yet a healthy tree canopy is essential to combat climate change. How do you propose to protect and increase the tree canopy? Well, first we can, we can pass the tree ordinance, but second of all, we just need to be prioritizing uh, trees. You know, and this is not just about the the, the pretty the, the things that prettify our our neighborhoods like this is actually an equity issue you find that in low income communities they actually have fewer trees than in wealthy neighborhoods and so we need to especially target those low income neighborhoods for a uh, expanded canopy because it provides cooling during heat waves during in, in areas that don't have access to air conditioning so it can actually be life saving shama tree canopy Absolutely support the tree ordinance, and we've met with many community members who are advocating for it. Uh, it is absolutely an equity issue, but the equity aspect of the tree canopy, meaning poorer neighborhoods, lower income neighborhoods having a lower tree canopy is a symptom of the larger inequality, which is why it is critical if we want to make progress, not regress next year, that this year we elect progressives and socialist candidates for tree canopy, for public transit, for affordable housing, and for sidewalks. Uh, this one's for Egan, but let's make it for both, starting with Egan. What's your solution to hate crimes on Capitol Hill? So as, as someone that has been in the, in the fight in the LGBTQ community, this is something we have to tackle urgently because it not only impacts the victims, but entire communities. This is something that I've been fighting for uh, since I started the, the Pride Festival and I've been very active in my community. I think that first of all, we have to have leaders that will speak about it and be able to counter some of the hate that's been, been really ginned up uh, by this particular president, president. And I believe that it's also important to have gay, queer, lesbian, bisexual, transgender leaders in our communities to be able to educate people and be, be able to advocate for the health and safety of their community. Shama? It is quite alarming how the uh, victory of Donald Trump and his White House and his administration has emboldened the current of right wing in our society, and this has happened in our city as well. Uh, and in order to fight that, we need to unite progressives uh, who may disagree on certain things, but we agree strongly that we need to uh, end hate crimes and protect all our LGBTQ community members. And in fact, a few years ago, when this question first came up, my office was honored to partner with the Gender Justice League and many other trans and LGBTQ organizations who wanted to address this. Of course, one of the main things they brought up was the lack of affordable housing and the economic eviction of LGBTQ people and the disproportionate representation in homelessness. This is directed at Sham and it goes back to homelessness. Uh, the person asks, what are your successes in resolving Seattle's homeless crisis so far and uh, what are you gonna focus on if re-elected uh, re to uh, make more progress? Uh, in 2014, my first year in city council, through our first